Hey friends, it's me Alyssa and I am back with Live and Local Atlanta. Today I'm joined by my incredibly talented friend. I'm here with Rib Hillis. He is the star of The Tales of Jim Bridger. We've seen him on General Hospital. We've seen him gracing our screens in horror movies and so much more. I'm so excited you're here today. Jim, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine. I love that you called me Jim. I feel like Jim. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You know what? It's a funny it's a funny thing as an actor. You 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 get associated with your character and on tall tales of jim bridger i get to play this this real life mountain man jim bridger and yet there's a lot of rib rib hillis is obviously brought to the screen because you know you can't help but but bring yourself there but yeah i i I, i've been called worse things than being called jim (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I am so sorry. I cannot believe I did that. But, you know, I'm so excited you're joining me today. Of course, I want to dive into the show and some of your other projects. But let's talk about kind of you did mention like there's there's a little bit of rib. There's a little bit of Jim when it comes to, you know, you being the character. How do you go through that process with with becoming the character? How do you kind of mesh and become one? Yeah, that's a great question. Um I just read a great quote by Christian Bale, who said that he he does all he can to lose himself so that he can recreate himself as a character. I I, I just found it so interesting. You know, a lot of the times we play these characters, I play these characters in these Lifetime movies that are just, you know, uh, whatever, man, dad, you know, businessman, you know, simple. But Jim Bridger is sort of a, a larger than life character. And so it did take a little bit more. Um, I, I had the benefit of being, I've spent quite a lot of time out in Montana over the last 10 years. I love the mountains. I love Montana. went to school in Colorado. So being out there in Montana, literally in the middle of the winter, out hiking, going ice climbing in the summertime, it it gave me a good sense of like, okay, this is what it would have been like for Jim, you know, back in the 1800s. Um, and then of course, the incredible wardrobe and makeup department. I, I didn't realize it until I'm watching the episodes now. We didn't have mirrors on set. It was we were out in on a very remote location. And I realize now how much I loved it because I didn't care what I looked like. And the makeup <laughs> department, the wardrobe department were always going up and making sure that whatever, you know, if there wasn't things out of place. But it was just such a, a fun experience to just literally put on this wardrobe, put on the, you know, I have a big beard that they put on and, and when I'm older, Jim, and not think about it and just sort of live in the moment it was really it was quite freeing i completely understand i am a firm practitioner of no mirrors when i wake up in the morning when i'm doing my makeup no mirrors i'm just like whatever happens happens and so i totally understand i feel like there's this level of freedom that you're just like whatever happens happens so i think that's exciting there there is but but it's a fun thing it's funny like I spent um, the majority of my adult life in a career where it is all about what you look like. I started modeling in college in, uh, gosh, 1992. (laughs) And, you know, that is a singularly superficial, what do you look like business. This moment on this show was really the first time that I didn't care at all because Jim wouldn't care. Like I remember in one scene, I took my hat and I put it back on my head and my hair was dangling down and my hair was kind of matted like this and and it had been raining and somebody said, you can push your hair out of your face. And I thought, nah, Jim Bridger would take his hat and stick it on his head. And as long as his hair wasn't blocking his eye, he wouldn't care. And it 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 is freeing. Like we should all just not care. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now, you've done so many different roles, and you talked about um, Jim Bridger being a little bit more complex. What's been your favorite experience with some of these other roles? Is, has it been just connecting with castmates? Has it been, you know, knowing you've done a project, it's under your belt, and you get to see the final product? What's been your favorite part of all of that? In terms of being part of Jim Bridger, the series? Just in general, the whole your whole career, your whole span of it all. It's a funny thing as an actor, I often feel like I'm more alive pretending to be somebody else than I am being myself. Uh, and I don't I, I imagine a lot of actors feel that way, but there's something incredibly freeing about not being encumbered by, you know, tax season coming up. What am I gonna make for dinner? Oh, I gotta pick the kids up at school. Characters in movies and TV shows, they live in these moments that are pure, like they're drama or they're you know passionate they're you know there's a lot of energy 
but you don't have to be encumbered by the mundane. And that's what's so fun about being an actor is you get to live this life in these short little bursts where you're not thinking about anything else. You're just thinking about, uh, you know, on, on Jim Bridger, there was some moments where we were in per severe peril. So you're just trying to stay alive. And other shows, I've been in ones where it's just hilarity and you're just living in that moment. Um, it, it's, uh, I don't know, I really I think that I think that we as actors have the greatest job ever. I totally agree. I think a lot of people don't realize they see people on screen. I, I hear it with radio too. They're like, well, I know how to talk. And it's there's a lot more that goes into it than just acting. Like people don't realize to portray a certain facial expression or an emotion, you really have to dig deep and like pull it out because I may be happy, but how can I portray sad if I'm feeling happy? So I think it's truly a, a blessing, a gift and a craft that people work at. And it's there's a lot more that we don't see as audience members that you all do. And it's truly incredible. So I'm super thankful for all of you incredible actors out there doing your thing. I think there's a bit of a masochist in all of us as actors, <laughs> especially ones uh, like my wife uh, does quite a lot of Lifetime movies. Lifetime movies typically have, you know, a woman in peril. And so, you know, she'll come home from set and be like, yeah, I, I, what'd you do? Like, I cried all day or I, I literally cried all month or, you know, on set. And as an actor, you you feel those things like you. I, I don't know how anyone else can have a tear come down or an emotion come down that can convey to an audience unless you feel it. Now, it's obviously you didn't actually lose your own child, but you do it as if. And so you feel that. And it's hard. Like you literally, you feel, you feel that, but there's something so perversely pleasurable in it. You know, that's where the masochism comes in. Like, oh, it just feels so good to, to do that, to, to bring that person to life and to feel those feelings. And ultimately, obviously we want the audience. Like sometimes I think it's more important for the audience to have an emotional reaction, for the audience to cry than for me as a character, as an actor to cry. Cause what I feel is secondary to what I get you to feel. Oh, absolutely. I And I, when I was a small child, maybe eight or nine, um, I really was so gung-ho. I was going to be an actor one day. I tried to do the make myself cry. It took a lot of work. And I was like, this is not the life for me. <laughs> this, this is not it. I, I did it. But I was like, no. Well, you were, that again. you were a child. <laughs> like, like that's, a, that's, that's a hard thing to come up with as a child. I, yeah, I was, I, it took me a while and I was like, I can do it. And for what a was bit, the, like a what was the thing, what was the thread you were pulling at that got the emotion? I just told myself to cry. I just, I just kept saying, cry, cry, cry. I was like, cry. So eventually I did it, but I was like, this is too much work. I, it's too much mental work for me. So it's fun to work. It's fun to work on a comedy, you know, like. You think like we've seen Will Ferrell movies. Like I, I haven't worked with him, but I could imagine that must be a fun day. Just <laughs> hilarity. Just the, like you see the bloopers and the outtakes and just just having so much fun. A lot of the stuff, you know, that I've gotten to do and I actually love is uh is a little more serious, a little more dramatic. Jim Bridger, again, there are some few lighthearted moments, but it's a very, it's a very severe, intense time. You know, these pioneers, these frontiersmen and the women that were out there, like their lives were on the line. And the very first day on set, our showrunner director, um, Paul Epstein said, took us aside and said, guys, I want you to think about this, about these are real people, you know, like imagine you and I are, are doing this interview, but right outside of us is we could be killed. There's danger, real danger, you know, whatever it might be. And you have to then think, how is that going to influence how we act right now? And it would change it. Be, we, there's places in the world right now that there's not a lot of hilarity and lightheartedness. And so we we tried to instill that in the feeling of, of the show. But obviously, you know, we don't want to we don't want to depress people. But it's you know, again, that's I feel like we're I feel like we're on the actor studio right now. We're talking about <laughs> acting so intensely. But that's what that's what I love to do. Oh, I love it. Now, speaking of, I like to, you know, everybody I think likes to imagine, would I survive during the pioneer days? Do you feel like you could actually survive now that you've been in this role? I don't know. I, I would <laughs> like I'd like to think I could, but they those those people were tough. Like, you know, I, I surely people, you know, people surprise themselves. We all have surprised ourselves, but you know, I mean, famously Jim Jim got shot by two arrows. They were able to pull one of them out. The other one was so wedged in there, they left it for three years. And the arrowhead was big. Like, imagine having 
like you have a splinter in you know in your finger or you have a blister on your foot for three years he had to survive and like f still battled and fought the, the elements animals na people um i don't know <laughs> they were a lot tougher than i am i know that Yes. And it, it's so, like you said, it's even freaky today when you hear those stories about somebody like a freak accident where they have a metal plate stuck in their head and they can't remove it. And I, it's so scary to think about the, situations. You remember the guy who had to cut his own arm off? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I was telling my eight year old son about it. And oh my God, maybe it'll cut. If I don't know if you remember his name, it's, I should have looked it up last night, but he's <laughs> rock climbing. He got his hand stuck and he was there for what was 106 hours. They made that movie and he, I don't know. Like talk, he could have survived back then. Okay. He could have. Probably so, yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I think that is so true. Now I have to ask, you know, I'm a third generation soap opera watcher. It's it runs deep in a Puerto Rican household. I have what to What was your show? What was the show that you guys watched growing up? Oh, well, my mom and grandma definitely switched between One Life to Live, General Hospital. I'm a general hospital girl. I still actively i stream it because i don't get to watch it live but i have to ask what was your favorite part of that experience being on general hospital it's one of the longest running soap operas you know it was i was young i was one of my first jobs when i came to la so i didn't have a lot to compare it to i mean think looking back the favorite part is just to be to be a part of such an iconic history and legacy of you know the show the soap world and general hospital in particular um you know as a young actor being on it just to be working, you know, to to be there. I mean, I, I honestly, I really didn't appreciate it. I didn't know what I had at the time. Um, so looking back, I think it's just the idea that I that I got to be there, that I was, you know, I was on General Hospital. I was killed. I was killed on General Hospital, which I think there's quite a few people probably have been killed on General Hospital. But just to be part of that legacy, it's really fun. Yes, yes, absolutely. If I were ever going to try my hand, that's my goal, is just to see if I can even make it on a soap opera, I think. You may have to cry. Fun. And it's the turnaround time. I think that even talking about a show like The Tales of Jim Bridger versus General Hospital, it's different types of acting. And the turnaround time for a soap opera versus what you're doing now, it's so incredible. It's different mentalities. I find the whole thing so fascinating. Have you been on the set of a soap opera? No, I haven't. I mean, I wish I could, but no. It's I really incredible because it's like a dance. You have, you know, five cameras, you know, right? Shooting simultaneously. And then the actors are, you know, you do a blocking rehearsal and you have to walk across here, deliver your line. Like, I can't believe you said that. And then turn around. And it's key because when you turn around, the, this camera is going to be here to get you. And if you say the line and you're not looking there. And so that it there was this incredible training for a young actor to learn how to work within the world that you're working in. Right. You're not just it's not just you and your buddy shooting in little indie film where you know, you, you, the camera is right in front of you. Like you learn, uh, you learn to respect the other departments, you know, sound department, uh, makeup department, all those are the writers. You know, there's a incredible training that comes from being on. So there's, there's also a very specific type of, uh, you know, sort of talents and acting. You got to process a hundred pages a day, uh, you know, more 30 as an individual, but, but doing things quickly, but Arcing on Tall Tales of Jim Bridger, we had a little bit more time. We we moved pretty fast, but then there's there's a different level of being able to really get down to the granular level, and you know they can push in, and we're gonna let's really let's really understand, let's really see what's going on behind the eyes. Pauses like silence, just silence and thinking is something you don't get a lot of opportunity on a soap opera because you're doing a hundred pages a day, so. Absolutely. I mean, it's like you said, it's intense. Um, you know, I have to ask, Rib, how, what is next for you? Can you give us a little teaser about what you might be getting into in the near future? Gosh, uh, well, there's a there's a script that a friend of mine I wrote uh, or worked on a movie with him. He's a director, um, Matt Toronto, and he wrote an incredible script. It's a, a very lifetime type story. I read it and I was like, this is amazing. So we're in sort of pre-production trying to develop that uh it's a a fantastic story about a a young a young mom who uh is debating whether to give her child up for adoption and she she wakes up from uh what she assumed was sort of emergency c-section like uh yeah you're, there's no child and she's like what and she has to figure out was that just a hallucination was it a dream it's a, i read this script and i was literally like a page turner i was like i've read a lot of lifetime 
type scripts and uh, that was fantastic it was like i'd love to make that so d- working on getting that made and then writing my wife and i are writing uh, a couple of different projects that we like to make because who wouldn't want to go work with their spouse and uh, <laughs> one of them would take place in italy um and then you know there's always things that come up i have an audition for something that shoots in europe so we we shall see so the life of an actor is you don't know when you're going to work next you're only as good as your next job. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I mean, and being in Italy sounds amazing. I'm sure you'll have a wonderful time. Rip, how can people stay in touch with you, follow you on social media and all of that? So just uh, my name, Rib Hillis, R-I-B-H-I-L-L-I-S. And I got the uh, the domains for like on uh, Instagram, um, on Facebook. Although, war- warning, my you know how there's pages and profiles on, on Facebook? Yes. My page got hacked so there's a page that's you know the sort i guess that's the professional side they haven't done anything with it yet so if you're watching guys i'd love to get it back um and if facebook's watching can you guys answer my emails i'd really love some help on this um but basically you can find me under my name um instagram is primarily uh facebook but instagram's the main source yeah Oh, absolutely. I don't think there's any harder worker out there than a Facebook scammer because they are always coming up with new ways to to scam. And they haven't done anything with it yet. I know that they they do. Sometimes you hear people, you know, you'll get someone will message you and be like, hey, I'm stuck in jail. Send me money. And you're like, this isn't real. But what's amazing to me, or it shouldn't be, is Facebook is so nonplussed. I've gotten emails back that says, I'm sorry, you've reached the department. There's it about uh, prob, you know, copyright infringement. And this is a case of you getting scammed. Unfortunately, at this point, we can't direct you to somewhere else. Like, what? You, okay. Yes. yes. You're going to take the time to reply and tell me that I'm replying to the wrong department, but not forward me to the right. De- like their, their public <laughs> their customer service is terrible. Yes. I a hundred percent agree with that for sure. Mark, Mark Zuckerberg, I need some help. Yes. Yes. Mark, help us, help us, please. This has been so fun, Rib. I have to have you back as soon as you're able. Um, and truly thank you for joining me today. This is live and local Atlanta. I'm your host, Alyssa. Make sure you download the free Odyssey app today. That's A-U-D-A-C-Y inside the app store. So you get notified of exclusive conversations, just like this one with my very talented friend, Rib. And make sure you give Star 94 a favorite once it's downloaded by hitting the heart in the top corner of your screen. And if you want to stay up to date with me, you can give me a follow at it's me underscore Lissa D at all social media platforms. And I will see you guys next time.